the civil law, I participate in local and regional policy and planning efforts. I also serve as, um, on a number of water-related boards and committees, including the Cow Creek Groundwater Conservation District. And so obviously water is a big topic for me. And uh, of course, for the civil law, protecting the region's water supply has always been a hallmark of our conservation efforts. Uh, you heard some of this from Lee, but many years ago we did create the Civil Oak Conservation Corridor to buffer and protect Civil Oak Creek from encroaching development and related stormwater pollution. The Civil Oak Preserve is a partner in this effort, and collectively we have been able to piece together a conservation corridor that is larger than Central Park in New York City. The Civil Oak was also instrumental in promoting a low impact development policy in Bernie that is now embedded in the city's unified development code. This policy will help to prevent Civil Oak Creek from becoming more polluted as development continues throughout the city, and it also uh, enhances stream setbacks to protect Bernie's creeks from encroaching development. Groundwater users in our region benefit from these efforts because most of the water in Civil Oak Creek enters the Karst Recharge Area just downstream from here. There, the water flows beneath the surface to become groundwater. Earlier this year, we invited Dr. George Benny, an international cave and karst expert, to present to the Kendall County Transportation Planning Committee. And Dr. Benny emphasized the importance of protecting the recharge area from impacts of development. His comments are represented throughout the Transportation Committee's recently released County of the Crossroads report, which you all can find online. The Civil Oak Center for Conservation has most recently partnered with the Civil Oak Conservancy, the Hill Country Alliance, the Nature Conservancy, and the Trust for Public Land to promote Kendall County's Proposition A, a bond that will provide $20 million for the protection of water sources in natural areas. And so while I mention it, I also hope you'll consider voting for Proposition A. <laughs> Don't forget to. All of our efforts, and many others that I haven't named, are informed by subject matter experts. We look to scientists, engineers, ecologists, and other experts to gather data, conduct studies, and run complex models that enhance our understanding of the natural systems and inform the practices that we recommend for conserving natural resources. Just like seeing the very best specialists for a medical procedure, we seek the best of, of the best to inform our efforts. Individuals who are competent in their field and integrate their subject of expertise into a holistic understanding of the to their topic by incorporating other relevant science as well as social and economic considerations into their research and recommendations. We seek experts who engage <clears throat> in the real-world application of their knowledge, offering insight to committees, boards, and governing councils, as well as to lay people and advocates. These are individuals who express not just their intellect, but their heart for humanity. And we are fond of experts, and anyone for that matter, who demonstrates intellectual honesty. Those who pursue personal... <coughs> sorry. Those whose personal beliefs and politics do not interfere with their, their pursuit of truth. Those who will not omit relevant facts and information even when such things may contradict their assumptions. It's a very important factor in science and in the pursuit of truth, to not bias it with your own beliefs. And so now it is my pleasure to introduce you to two experts who demonstrate these qualities, individuals we frequently look to for their knowledge and insight, and with whom we are honored to collaborate. As previously mentioned by Lee, today's lecture features Dr. Robert Mace from the Meadows Center for Water and the Environment and Dr. Michael Young from the Bureau of Economic Ge Geology at the University of Texas. Dr. Young is going to be our first presenter, and so I'll introduce him first at this time. Now, he, uh, he's, <laughs> he's a charming chap. He, uh, he, I asked him for a short biography, and he gave me a short, a shorter, and the shortest. <laughs> And so, in the interest of uh, preserving some time for present presentations, um, you said Mike, Mike. did I say Mike? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to introduce Robert Mace, who's the other <laughs> Robert Mace is the other charming chap. Um, and so, uh, I'm going to read Dr. Mace's thank you shorter uh, um, in, uh, biography. Uh, Robert Mace is the executive director and chief water policy officer of the Meadows Center for Water and the Environment and a professor of practice in the Department of Geology at Texas State University. Robert has over 30 years of experience in hydrology, hydrogeology, stakeholder processes, and, and water policy. Robert has a Bachelor of Science in Geophysics and a Master's in Hydrology from the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology and a PhD in Hydrogeology from the University of Texas at Austin. 
And uh, I want to invite you all to give a round of applause after I read his shortest bio. You ready for this? Here's Bob! <laughs> Thank you. I've never been mistaken for Michael Young before, but, but I'm, I'm glad you think I have enough <laughs> testosterone to grow a beard so healthy. Uh, it's, I wouldn't be able to do that. Um, it's, it's my pleasure and honor to be with you this afternoon, and, and, uh, and also my pleasure and honor for you all to be here, um, spend a Saturday to uh, hear about water. Um, how many in here love water? Let's see, is anybody? I was, I was going to find somebody with their hand down to find out what their problem was. But, so why do, you, why do you love water? It goes good in bourbon. Goes good in bourbon, all right. Drink, you know, drinking, kind of, yeah. Goes good in bourbon. Basis of life. Basis of life. Yeah, if we didn't have water, we wouldn't have anything. We'll die in three days. Yeah, we'll die in three days. Does anybody go down to the river? Or the, the yeah, so, so the flows, spring flows, uh, recreation, um, environmental. Um, anybody here have, have cattle, cows, goats? Here we go, you know, so <laughs> got some livestock over here. Um, you know, Bernie wouldn't be uh, as bustling as it is if it didn't have water. People wouldn't, wouldn't show up. Um, so, so water connects all these different things. So, so to, you know, kind of uh, give away the um, um, punchline, I mean, the future of water is, is importance is not in jeopardy. We all know and recognize the importance of water. But perhaps what's, what's the bigger question is, is um, where are we gonna get it in the future of our supplies? It was mentioned earlier about how rapidly we're growing. And, uh, and, and really Central Texas as a whole is like ground zero. Um, you know, it, it amazes me driving, and I've, I've been in Central Texas since 91, driving between San Antonio and Austin, and it's just become one thing. And then, you know, the, the robot overlords sent me through down to San Antonio 1604 and then up I-10 to get here. And so I was, was able to, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's constant between here. I think I saw maybe one pasture or one undeveloped piece of land um, coming up here. And so, so we're, we're, we're kind of turning into a, Bran, a Brangelina, is that right? It's, uh, you know, San Austonio um, or or uh, Saustonio, or Hot Saustonio, it's my per personal favorite, but we're turning into a, a megapolis, and, and it's a very thirsty one. So, so I want to, as an overview of my presentation, talk about drought. I think drought's on a lot of our minds right now. It's certainly on mine, so I wanna kind of bring you up to speed of you know, where we're at and where we think we're going in the near future. Um, I'm also gonna talk about, about climate and climate change. I wanna stress I'm not here to wag fingers at anybody about something you should or shouldn't be doing. I'm approaching it from the standpoint of the water scientist that's interested in you know, what does climate change, what does increasing temperatures mean for our water supplies going forward? And then finally, talk about uh, a potential solution, which is this uh, um, relatively new concept called One Water, thinking about water in a holistic way uh, in terms of where our future supplies come from, because the, the easy water is, for the most part, gone. Um, I, I mean, I don't expect to see any new reservoirs built in central Texas. Um, our aquifers are already uh, being hurt by the production we're having, and many places we're, we're beyond sustainable levels of pumping. Uh, so, so one water might be uh, an answer to that. So, uh, so I work at the Meadow Center, and so I'm right there. My office overlooks Spring Lake. And, uh, and so when I go to work every day, um, um, it's, you know, I, I live in North Central Austin, but I like to say I have the best commute in the world because the parking lot to my office, I get to see this beautiful spring every day. And, uh, and with this drought, um, it's been a little sad because I can see that lake level going down, indicating that the spring flows are getting lower and lower. Um, the, uh, how many of y'all been on a glass bottom boat ride? So that's, that's one of our educational programs. Cream of wheat, you remember cream of wheat, that big field with all that kind of bubbling porridge? It's like down to maybe less than a dozen little bubbling areas. It's, it's pretty sad looking right now. Um, for this presentation, I didn't realize it was this bad. I mean, I knew it was bad, I didn't realize it was this bad. 
Um, I pulled down the uh, spring flow that the US Geological Survey mentions, and we're the lowest we've been since that drought in 96. And that was a drought that caused the creation of Senate Bill um, 1 water planning, you know, caused some major policy changes around the state. Um, looking at the drought map, um, you know, you guys are close to that center in Kendall, Kendall County there in, in extreme drought. Um, and then there's that exceptional drought that's just to y'all's east, um, which, which is pretty much including uh, San Marcos, um, Kamal, uh, parts of Bear County. Um, and it's, it's been that way for, for a while now, just, just really blazing dry. Um, it was great to get some, some of that recent rain that came through. Uh, this is the rain totals from Water Development Board's Tex Mesonet. And uh, you guys are really lucky because you're right on the edge of the one inch rainfalls. You know, if it had been a little further north, you wouldn't have gotten as much. Um, so that's good, but we are a long ways off from coming out of drought. And so what you're looking at here is uh, um, how much rain, how much more rain do we need to come out of drought conditions? Um, this is, it's called, a, it's a, a drought index, PDI. And we need, in this area, nine to 12 inches of rain to come out of drought. And then right next door, we're looking at over 15 inches to come out of drought. So we've got a long ways to go before we come out of drought. Um, and the outlook isn't looking good, at least for the next three months. Uh, this is a product that the Climate Data Center puts out um, with the um, Climate Prediction Center, rather, with uh, NOAA. And uh, that um, brown color is continue or worsen, um, which we are in the middle of. And then, and then they're also projecting uh, development. Even worse, um, you know, I, I look at, I've been looking at these things for, gosh, more than 20 years. And when you see drought across the landscape like that, it tends to be far more persistent. It's harder to break. There's kind of a feedback loop that happens with these things. And so that, that doesn't bode well, and it's, and it's expanded out to the east over recent uh, month, months. There have been some improvements. The monsoon season in uh, New Mexico, kind of the summer afternoon rains has been really strong this year. Uh, we've been fortunate there. Um, but at least through, um, this is um, out through, um, out through January, um, we're looking at uh, continuation, um, if not uh, worsening of drought conditions. Big part of that's driven by El Nino Southern Oscillation. So I'm sure everybody's heard of El Nino, La Nina. Um, it's, it's basically sea surface temperatures in the central Pacific. Um, that once coupled with the atmosphere, then we tend to see under El Nino conditions, um, cooler than normal, wetter than normal conditions in Texas. Under La Nina, warmer than normal, drier than normal conditions. And so the purple line here is showing actual, the, uh, the blue shaded area is where the temperatures um, are in La Nina conditions. And, uh, and that red line is showing um, the expert projection. The shade is showing kind of the uncertainty in the different methodologies they use to project um, El Nino, La Nina conditions. And I've also got last month's projection, because um, I always like to see how bad they mess it up. And, it, and it's interesting that they tend to be more positive about things. There's been a trend this year where they tend to predict we're gonna come out of La Nina, but we seem to, things seem to go the other direction. Um, you know, they are projecting that we're gonna come out into what the cool kids call La Nava. So we'll be neither La Nina or El Nino. We'll be in the middle there, which would be an improvement over La Nina conditions. Um, but something I've noticed this year too is, is they keep pushing that out. Um, so every month it gets updated, it gets pushed out a little more. That doesn't mean that we're not gonna go into um, neutral conditions in the spring. Uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed on that. Um, but it is problematic that we're not getting our, our normal rainfalls um, so far this fall. Uh, it doesn't bode well um, going into, into next year. And we'll keep our fingers crossed that maybe we do get some good spring rainfalls that pull us out of drought. Um, if you wanna, I, I write a column every month for Texas Plus Water. If you Google Texas Plus Water, you can actually sign up for it. Um, with with uh, a lot of these plots, and I go into those things, and you kind of look. It's like one place you can go, kind of see all the the information and what's going on with uh, 
um, kind of climate or, or weather and, and water conditions across the state. Um, all right, so, so let's transfer into climate. So there's a saying, um, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. Um, and climate is, generally it's, it's like uh, average conditions over a 30 year period. And then uh, NOAA will kind of shift things forward as we you know, cross each five, each five and 10 year new increment. Um, this is showing um, temperature um, um, for the planet, uh, average temperature. And uh, in the, the black line you see on the right is observed. So I mean, somebody's actually measured it. Um, and then it's, and then you see reconstructed that goes back more than 2000 years. You know, that, that might come from a, a number of different um, um, methods. Um, one common way is looking at um, air bubbles in ice cores. Um, so drilling through some of the, the thick glaciers and then testing um, um, what's in those bubbles and then that can be correlated back to temperature. Um, but but uh, this is uh, not, not quite exactly the, the famous hockey stick plot that uh, Michael Mann and his colleagues came up with, but, but it's showing that, um, um, you know, indicating that there's a pretty steep increase in temperature that's occurred over the last uh, 150, 200 years. Um, and then you'll notice on the left here, it says the warmest multi-century period, more than 100,000 years there. And we're, you know, just recently we're peaking above that. Um, so this puts the, wet, the uh, temperature data on a longer time scale. Um, this, plot, this plot's uh, a little strange, but cool. Um, <laughs> so over here, we're looking at 1850 um, to 2000. I chopped off some projections there since it would be distracting. Um, and then, then we've got a different scale here that goes from um, uh, 1850 back 800,000 years ago then 800,000 years ago to 10 million years ago, 10 million years ago to 60 million years ago. Um, different ways that scientists use to make estimates of temperature, you know, I mean, you know, like, like the cave deposits that we have in the hill country, um, there's scientists that will go in and look at those different layers, almost like tree rings, and be able to pull out um, information that gives us a sense of what um, rainfall and temperature was like in those conditions. Um, and so, so again, we're showing that increase in temperature there on the far right. And then um, you can look right here. Um, you know, this is, this is, I'm sorry, right here. Um, well, in this area is, is in that 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. And uh, the rate things are going, it won't be too long before you have to go back, gosh, three million years ago to find a time on the earth that was warmer. Um, I love this plot too, because uh, I'm part geologist. So, you know, because it, it shows, and sometimes you'll hear people say, well, of course, of course there's climate change, the climate's always changing, which is true. You know, we used to be a molten ball of lava. <laughs> I'm told it was hot back then. Um, we, you know, we have been warmer in the past, and this is, this is showing that. What's cool about this too is that, you know, geologists um, can look back at these times and see what the world was like. And so it's, in a way, it's, it's a, a method of, of uh, um, benchmarking the temperature that we're at now, what might be coming in the future, rather than just relying on models going forward. Um, you know, my professional expertise um, used to be numerical groundwater flow modeling, so I know lots of assumptions are made, and um, I have my own suspicions about the climate models. This, this makes me feel better about the climate models that when they're projecting forward, they also have an idea of what things look like in the past. Um, I'm not showing you the plot of um, carbon dioxide equivalent um, concentrations, but it pretty much looks exactly like this. Um, there's a, a pretty direct correlation there. Um, Antarctic ice sheets started forming about this time period here. Um, hopefully, we don't, uh, hopefully we don't get that warm. Um, but, uh, but again, this is just kind of giving you a sense of, of where we're at. And, and uh, then the question is, is where are we going in the future? I um, also wanna, wanted to put this up. This is, the dots are showing observed, measured 
data of temperature. And it's showing um, the different contributions that lead to um, um, this rise in temperature. And then this gray line is actually, it, it's all the factors um, added together. So, so we've got greenhouse gases here, which if it was only greenhouse gases, we'd be a bit warmer today. Um, ozone is also upping the temperature. Um, solar has uh, pretty much been flat. Sometimes you'll hear people say, well, it's, all, it's the sun. Um, the sun certainly does have an impact, um, but it has not had an impact over the last uh, 200 years. Volcanoes um, tend to uh, have a cooling um, influence, although back, back in geologic history, there was some major basaltic flows that, that a bunch of CO2 came out that actually created some hothouse earth conditions. Um, but but uh, the, the volcanic activity we see tends to um, pr provide some momentary cooling. Um, land use, so um, we hear a lot these days about the Amazon. Um, that, you know, if the Amazon gets completely mowed down, that will have a, uh, an influence on the climate. Um, and, then, uh, and then aerosols, which is pretty much kind of like um, a particulate uh, air pollution. Um, and it, it, it has had a substantial cooling effect um, on the climate. This one's kind of a bummer because uh, if people seek to decrease air pollution, it'll actually um, provide less cooling, which will make it warmer. Um, so kind of a, a, a push, interesting push-pull there. Um, so I just, I just throw this up there. I find this really interesting because, it, again, it breaks out all the different factors to uh, you know, attempt to explain you know, what is going on here. Um, and then the models are used um, to, against this data to test. And so, so we've got simulated um, with kind of the average in this lighter color here of the models. And then the, the spread here is there's all these different models. And, and so that's the range of model answers. And, and when there's a great deal of uncertainty, what the, what the climate scientists like to do is just average them all together and you hope that errors on one are canceled out by errors on another, and that the average winds up being um, more realistic. Um, it's, oops, and it's not a perfect fit um, down here in terms of measuring the observed here in this darker color, um, but you know, that's good enough for government work. Um, <laughs> this is showing natural and human conditions. So all those things we saw in the previous plot are considered in the models. And if they take out the human forcings, um, this, is, this is what we get. So uh, this is where we would be, we would be without um, kind of the human forcings in there, the greenhouse gases, the aerosols, and whatnot. Um, so, so then the question is, is uh, what does the future, or what might the future look like? And uh, outside of climate science, you know, people will ask me, what's the future look like? It's like, if I knew what the future was, I would have won that Powerball, <laughs> that $700 million. I don't know what it is up to today. I think somebody actually won it, so I think it's down quite a bit. Um, it's really hard to predict the future. Um, and the biggest, but the interesting thing is the biggest uncertainty is how societies respond to climate change, you know, what they do with emissions. And so, so that's what all these different lines are here, are different assumptions on how much emissions get emitted. And you can see the spread, it's quite a spread. Um, you hear a lot in the press about 1.5 degrees Celsius being the goal, which is about three degrees Fahrenheit, and that's that one right there. And then all the way, it goes all the way up to a 10 degree Fahrenheit um, average increase. The shaded areas, again, are uncertainties on those model projections going forward. Um, in the old days, in the old days, not being too long ago, five years ago, we talked about representative concentration pathways, RCPs. Uh, the, the new um, um, way of referring to these is SSPs, shared socioeconomic pathways. SSPs and RCPs are about the same. Um, the reason I'm telling you all about that stuff is it becomes important so you don't get too despondent when you read the newspaper articles about how the, how the, the world might end from climate change going forward. Um, is, uh, you know, a, lot, a lot of times what you find 
is in scientific studies, and get what's reported in the paper is RCP 8.5 or SSP 8.5. Um, sometimes it's referred to as a business as usual. I've also heard it referred to as let's dig, let's dig up all the petroleum and burn it. Um, and, 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 and I've also heard it referred to as a worst case scenario, but um, I've been around the world long enough to know things could always be worse. Um, so it isn't, but it is the worst scenario projection going forward. And uh, I've been involved with the city of Austin and its, its uh, consideration of climate change and its water planning, as well as with uh, Edwards Aquifer Authority as it's looking at the Edwards Aquifer. And, uh, um, and Ben, been involved in discussions about planning with climate scientists. And one thing I learned is that climate scientists like to run RCP um, 8.5 scenarios. And the reason is, is it's computationally efficient. You hit all the temperatures going up to 10 degrees Fahrenheit here. You hit all the temperatures. So you don't have to run all these, these things. You just run that one and, and then you show the results. Um, but for water, it's really important what the temperature is. Um, Austin's current plan plans for this scenario, and, uh, and, and I realize that that's probably, that's way, way um, um, worse than it should be. Um, and here's why. Um, there's a group called Climate Action Tracker that uh, tracks the, what countries have committed to doing to decrease greenhouse gases, what they've promised, um, what they've pledged, and then, and then they, these guys make a projection of what, what the temperature is gonna look like in the future, what they think it's gonna look like. Um, again, you see the, uh, the shaded area here because there's uncertainty from the models in projecting forward. And so the good news, which I think is good news, I think is promising, is that um, with, with concrete policies in action, right now I think 2.5 to 2.9, degrees uh, Celsius. Approximately multiply that by two, technically 1.8 to get uh, Fahrenheit, but you know, five to six degrees Fahrenheit warmer. Um, I don't know about you all, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't want, um, and there are consequences from that, but that's a heck of a lot different than 10 to 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so, so that, that's positive. You hear a lot in the press. In fact, when I was driving down here this morning, I heard, heard something on the news about 1.5. Um, we're not gonna hit 1.5. I mean, there's still a slight chance of doing it, but um, I'm willing to put 100 bucks on the table <laughs> that we're not gonna hit 1.5 um, for anybody here in a bet. Um, but I do feel like with time, we'll probably be in the 1.5 to two degrees Celsius. Um, level. Again, that's good news because that is not this. So, so my word of advice if you follow climate change stuff closely is look to see, look for RCP or SSP and see what the number is. You know, we're, we're probably, you know, if, if it existed, we're probably at RCP 3.3. We're, we're, we're probably, actually that one's pretty good, two degrees Celsius, so um, 2.6, um, or for it, yeah, I'd say about, probably about 2.6. Um, so look to see if uh, the study says that they're at 8.5. Um, my personal opinion is that that's, that's unrealistic. Um, so feeling tipsy. Um, one of the reasons there's so much focus on 1.5 degrees Celsius is there's, there's tipping points out there that, that could be triggered with, with uh, the warming. And uh, this is uh, from a paper by Wonderling and others. Um, and, and the graphic is by The Guardian. They did a fantastic job. The graphic in Wonderling and others sucks. That's why you don't trust scientists with public communication. Because <laughs> it's like you look at it and you're like, what's this show? Um, these guys did a fantastic job. So, so each of these bars is showing the range of where the tipping point might exist. In this case, the Greenland ice sheet collapse and then the red dot shows a central estimate. Um, and so all these different things, West Antarctic ice sheet collapse, of course this has consequences for sea level rise, tropical coral reef die off, northern permafrost abrupt thaw, that wouldn't be good, Barents sea ice loss, et cetera, et cetera, mountain glaciers loss. Um, there was uh, articles in 
this morning's news about concerns in Europe about the, the snowfall and the glaciers melting. What are they going to do since they rely on it for water supply and, and power generation? Um, so, so one reason people are um, so concerned about the 1.5 is you know, we're getting deeper into potentially triggering um, some of these things. Should note too that some of these things um, could then actually increase the CO2 and send us off um, my rosy interpretation of 2.6. So again, we have to watch that pretty closely. Um, okay, so um, getting to Texas, um, this is some work from, uh, from a paper by John Nielsen Gammon, state climatologist and others. I'm one of the other, and uh, <laughs> there's a group of us. And this is showing um, Palmer Drought Severity Index um, projected out forward with, uh, with climate change. And, and so it's that red line here. And so this is um, um, kind of what we, where we've been historically. You know, there's, that's approximately the drought of the 50s right there. You know, we had some nasty droughts way back when um, in the late 1800s that show up. And, and, uh, and then um, it all goes to hell. Um, the, you know, we're looking at, you know, he's projecting here in you know, almost permanent um, drought of 50s type conditions. Um, this, this is for East Texas. He has a similar one for West Texas that looks even worse. Um, but what did I say, right? It's RCP 8.5. So it's probably not going to be this bad, um, but this does maybe give us a clue that things are going to be hotter, drier, and more, more challenging. Look, Dr. Young, I mentioned soil moisture up here. <laughs> okay, so, um, so currently in Texas, the state water planning does not consider climate change. So one of the things we're doing at the Meadow Center is um, looking at the climate data with the goal of identifying how might climate change um, affect water resources. And we also want to approach it from not RCP 8.5, that worst case scenario, but what, is it, what does it look like we're going and what does that mean for our water supplies going forward? Austin's analysis of Highland Lakes shows that in 100 years, the reliable supply from the Highland Lakes will be down 50% um, from today, which is shocking. However, it's RCP 8.5, um, so, so it probably won't be as bad as that. Um, maybe it's more like 25%, which is bad enough. Um, okay, oh, and if you want to learn more, um, we've got a podcast at the Meta Center. Um, kind of one of, the, one of the partners we work with is Texas Climate News, if you're looking for specific Texas climate stuff. And then uh, we have a blog. It's, it's down right now. It's going to come back out. Um, we're renaming it hotter than a um, habanero, so I guess an indication of climate change. It's getting warmer. So, <laughs> now the uh, we've got a new climate science um, director, Dr. Mona Wells, and and she goes, sometimes jalapenos aren't that hot. You know, habaneros are always hot. So, I'm like, okay, yeah, let's do it. Let's do jalapeno. All right, so let's talk about potential solutions. Um, and uh, I'd like to share this. This is a story of two Austin families. It's a little old, 2013. This was my assistant when I worked at the Water Development Board. Four people, two adults, two cute kids. Um, average annual use is 111 gallons per person per day. Um, at the time, um, in 2013, the average annual gallons per person per day for an average Texan was about 95 gallons per minute. I was just at a meeting at the Water Conservation Advisory Council um, earlier this week where uh, that number is now down to 75, which is, which is a good development. So, so keep that in mind. Um, you know, and then, well, you know, why, why is there so much water use in the summer? Mm -hmm. Irrigation, yeah, irrigation. Otherwise, you know, this is actually pretty efficient use when they're not, they're not irrigating. Um, and, then, uh, and then there's my household. Um, Uh-oh. So... Two people, two adults, eight cute cats. So that's 35 gallons per person per day, seven gallons per mammal per day. Um, and, uh, and so we, you know, we built a house, we're fortunate enough to build a house in, in Austin and, and made it very water efficient. And, and really the goal was we're not gonna use any city water outside. We have 5,000 gallon rainwater tank, which is not included in this, we'll call that alternative supply. 
Um, we, we capture the air conditioning condensate. Um, we have xero escaping, um, I call it Aggie Zoysia. A&M's done some great work on drought tolerant Zoysia. So once it's established, you don't, have to, you don't have to water it. It'll look like hell when it gets really dry because it'll brown up, but as soon as it rains, it greens up really quick. And, uh, and I love it because when my neighbor is outside mowing his yard and it's 110 degrees, I'm inside sipping my Shiner Bach, you know, just kind of watching him because I don't have to go outside. Um, so I know what you're thinking, two things, right? One is, is Robert, do you take showers with, with uh, that low? And, and uh, yeah, we cer certainly do. We live, there's nothing special we do inside except we do have a dual flush toilet, um, but that doesn't save that much water. In fact, our primary water use is showers right now. If I could get my wife to cooperate more, we could probably have this 35 gallons per person per day. But uh, she made it real clear. It was a choice between water savings and a divorce. And so I, 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 ch I chose love over water. Um, the other thing you're thinking is, uh, how cute are those cats? Um, they're pretty cute. They're pretty cute. <laughs> Um, so one water, um, Mitchell Foundation has uh, put out this report um, that's been pretty influential for, for Texas in introducing the concept of, of one water. And, and it's, it's basically integrated urban water management um, and its approach to managing finite resources for long-term resiliency, reliability, meeting both community and ecosystem needs. Um, I don't like the word urban. Um, you know, to me, I think maybe more of a built environment. Um, I'm not sure folks here in Bernie would consider themselves an, you know, an urban area. Um, this can be done on a building scale. So it could be done on this, this building. Is there rainwater on this building? Yes. Yeah, there we go. So there we go. We're doing it on this building. Um, so it's looking as the city as a source or the built environment as a source. Um, so um, it's gonna be hard for you to see this, but it's just to remind me to talk about, you know, there's many sources of water with the building. So the rainwater harvesting here, um, air conditioning condensate um, can be captured and used. Um, you can capture, um, this is probably not a good space for it since you, you know, nicely you have pervious cover um, for your drives, but if you had concrete cover, you could capture that stormwater flow store it and use it. A&M's been really good at doing that at, at some of their newer buildings. They build storage underneath the parking lot and then they use that water for irrigation. Um, even the water that comes out of the toilets can be used for, it can be reused for something, treated and reused um, as, as a supply of, of, of water. Um, so just some, some urban examples, the uh, Austonian in downtown Austin, um, they wanted to do rainwater harvesting, but skyscrapers don't have big roofs. And the engineer they hired um, was like, there's not gonna be enough water to irrigate the grounds with rainwater harvesting, but air conditioning condensate produced a bunch of water. Plus, air conditioning condensate goes up during the summer, and the plant use goes up during the summer. So the source and demand matches up perfectly, and that's what they use to meet their outdoor water supplies. Um, Austin's new library uh, uses both rainwater harvesting and air conditioning condensate um, for the grounds, but they also bring it indoors to flush toilets and urinals. And so doing this, they've been able to reduce their demand on the city supply, which is the Colorado River, by 90%. Recently, there hadn't been much rain, and, and they've been able to run the system on air conditioning condensate alone, um, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, they've also, Austin's also done something pretty cool. It's an on-site black water reuse um, plant, uh, project. And this is where they're taking the water that comes out of the toilets, um, the drinking water fountains, the urinals. They have an on-site skid-based um, water, wastewater treatment plant that's like, it's like the, my width and the length of this room um, has hydroponics on it. Um, I got a tour of it, it's actually kind of back, back behind here. They've built it in, you can walk up here and kind of look down on it and see the hydroponics. I was getting a tour of it and I looked over and I was like, is that a pot plant? I mean, it looked like they were growing weed in it. <laughs> and uh, the engineer went over and looked at it and he got a really concerned look and he goes, yeah, I, I don't know, I don't know. It was hibiscus, I guess hibiscus looks like, <laughs> looks much like Mary Jane, anyways. Um, and so they've created these characters, um, and so this is 
Clara for the closed loop advanced reclaimed assembly, that's a wastewater treatment, and then they also have on-site um, rainwater and condensate harvesting that they use. And similarly, they've been able to reduce uh, water consumption at this building, which is their, uh, uh, where you go now to get a permit to build in Austin, uh, 90, 95%, so pretty amazing. Um, those are big urban things, but uh, Meadow Center has been fortunate to be involved with the Wimberley One Water School uh, along with a number of other partners. And they're putting in a new school, they were looking to do the conventional uh, method of uh, water supply and wastewater treatment. And a uh, group went in and convinced them to try something new using one water. And so they collect rainwater and AC condensate, they do on-site treatments of wastewater and then use that wastewater to water uh, the grounds. And again, reduced its use of the Trinity Aquifer by 90%. And, uh, and, and even better, it's gonna save them $800,000 um, in over 30 years in utility costs. So it can be a, a cost savings. Um, Wimberley is, is now moving forward with building a library. They're gonna follow kind of the same tenets going forward. Um, it's great to hear, I guess, the Shield Airs mentioned earlier. Um, I visited with them yesterday and got a kind of briefing on the work they've been doing at their campsite and it's completely off the grid. And so all the energy is, is uh, generated on site. And uh, although the only thing they air condition is the kitchen, so I'm not sure I could swing my wife into that. Um, but, um, and then all the water is, uh, is, is rainwater. Um, this tank down here is actually for fire. Um, in case there's a fire, this is the source of the fire, but they've got rainwater tanks off of this building here to provide water to uh, various um, camping structures. So. Um, so very neat project, um, it's beautifully done, and, uh, and they've had to be trailblazers, particularly in working with Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and being a public, they're the first public drinking water supply that uses rainwater, uh, if you can believe that. Um, so um, this is my last slide, a little over, sorry. Um, just wanted to, um, I have this one up here to remind me that um, you have to be careful with water because uh, there's unintended consequences. I guess when you do one thing with water, you gotta look at the big picture and go, what is changing? Um, so for example, Austin is doing more and more with water reuse, but if Austin reuses all of its water, there's no water being returned to the Colorado River for, for environmental flows. Now I know um, treated wastewater to rivers is not, is not a advisable thing to do in the hill country because of the pristine streams. Um, but uh, um, downstream of Austin, I think it's, I think it's okay because the streams aren't as pristine. And also, they just wouldn't have flows in them um, if uh, we didn't have treated wastewater going back. So, so you have to think about, about those things. Like if you're, if you're using water more efficiently here, what happens um, elsewhere? I, my friends in San Antonio will tell me stories about, you know, they're also very active with reuse. They're also very active with water conservation, and they've gotten so good at water conservation, the reuse folks are like, wait a minute, man, we're not getting as much water as we used to get, and you know, what are y'all doing over there? Um, so you have to be, be careful of that. And then finally, one last thing is, uh, um, for these different strategies, information and data and understanding where you're at and your system is, is critically important in planning out and knowing uh, where you need to go. So. That's to kind of help set you up. So to conclude, we need more rain. Drought expected to continue through February. Um, it's been getting warmer, and it will get warmer. Um, you can quote me on that, warmer. Is there a reporter in the room? Um, that's, that's, that will affect our water supplies. Um, and so we need to be smarter about using water. And so one water leverages the built environment. Um, for water, and that's pretty easy water to get. Rainwater, air conditioning, condensate um, is pretty easy to get to uh, decrease the water use and, and make our existing water resources go, go farther. And uh, those cats sure are cute. Okay. <laughs> Turn it back over. I think we're doing questions at the end, right? Um, thank you, Robert. Okay, so. Um, that was a great presentation. Again, we already had some Q&A. Um, it's, a, it's a hard topic, I think, to discuss in some cases, talking about the uh, changing climate. And uh, I'm sure people are going to have some, uh, some questions to follow up. Uh, so don't forget what your questions are. Um, 
The next person, Dr. Michael Young. Um, Dr. Young, let's see, I met him at a Hill Country Alliance meeting, or a Hill Country Conservation Network meeting up in uh, Blanco. And I was talking about some work that I was doing here in Bernie, uh, really with the goal of creating a model green community. And um, he listened, he was relatively quiet, he was part of sort of the group I was energized that day. And um, so after the president, after we got to speaking, you know, he got along the way, he said, I'm with this group called Planet Texas 2050 that he was very involved in at the time at the, at the, uh, at the University of Texas. And he, he, I said, you know, I'm curious about that, I want to learn more. And he gave me his card. Um, day later, I think, I called him or he texted him and I said, hey, I'd like to meet with you. And he said, okay, great. He said, when do you, can you come up? I'm like, I don't know, tomorrow or the next day, right? So I ran up to, to Austin because I was that curious and sat down and we talked, uh, I really listened to what he had to say about work that he was doing, uh, but I told him about this work we were doing at Bernie, we told him we had a cool new uh, mayor who was, I think, easy to work with on some of this stuff. And he said, well, why don't you guys work on creating a model resilient community? And I thought, now that's something I can run with. I was being kind of quiet about the model resilient community, I was just trying to be under the radar there, but model resilient community. So sure enough, um, uh, I went back to, to Bernie and literally within a day or whatever, I was at the presentation by the mayor and I pulled him aside in the parking lot afterwards. I said, hey, I just met this cool guy, named Michael, Dr. Michael Young at the UT, and uh, would you would you be interested in meeting with him? We're talking about some, some approaches that we could take to make Bernie a model resilient community. He said, yeah, I'm definitely interested. And um, from there, some cool things happened. Uh, Michael's going to talk about a lot of them, but, I, but there's one that I don't think he's going to mention. Uh, he was able to help the um, Kindle, the, the Bernie and Kindle County Economic Development Corporation received free strategic planning from a gentleman named Dr. Stephen Pedigo from the University of Texas. And that's now the first strategic plan that, I, that, that I'm aware of, that anybody's aware of, I think, in at least in Texas, that emphasizes, cons emphasizes conservation of natural resources as important to the economic development of Bernie and Kindle County. It emphasizes the need for obviously preserving our water, but also our natural environment, our beautiful streams and in in open spaces, as well as um, providing mobility options like trails. Um, so it's a really forward thinking um, strategic plan that I think also uh, can get attribu attributed back to Michael Young's efforts for the city of Vermont and the community. And, um, so, with that, Dr. Michael Young is a senior research scientist at the Bureau of Economic Geology, Jackson School of Geosciences at, at UT Austin. He received his PhD specializing in soil physics and hydrology from the University of Arizona, and has 35 plus years of experience in soil physics and hydrology, land and energy interactions, conservation of water and land resources, and environmental geosciences. Recently, he has focused on land alteration and environmental impacts from expansion of energy systems and management systems for water data. That was like way over my head, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Young mentors graduate students in these related topics, uh, and I would argue he mentors me to some degree, and he's a fellow of the Geological Society of America. And so with that, please welcome Dr. Young. Awesome, thank you. And uh, it really is an honor to be here. And, um, you know, being at a university, it's really hard to see where communities get together and how volunteerism and, and, and sort of civic pride really fits. And so it's wonderful to see the, the board of directors and, and the Cibolo. So um, it's really great to, to be here and to see that. Um, and yeah, Ben is very hard to say no to. And so he came over and he kept pestering me to do something. And I was like, well, we really ought to do something. Um, and you know, when we talk about sort of the resiliency, there's economic resiliency, there's energy resiliency, there's water resiliency, the things that we rely on as, as a community and as a society. Without those, things start to break down. We see what's happening in Europe right now um, on the energy picture. There's parts of the planet that are basically very, very dry. We're getting lots of, of instability of societies and things like that. So trying to maintain these systems um, during hard times to make them resilient, that's really the key, the key thing. And, and it, all, it all stems from, from data. And it all stems from information that we use to make decisions. Do we, is, it, is the data collected where we need it to be collected and, and how? Is it presented in a way that we can understand it? And, and rarely is that true, right? We usually have 
satellites flying around and they're collecting something and no one's really sure exactly how to get to it. Um, you know, all the, all the global climate models, are, they're almost impenetrable, even to the climate modelers themselves. And for the general public to understand the difference between RCP 8.5 and 4.5, that's really a, a stretch that's, that's pretty far for a lot of people that are not thinking about this every day. You know, there's a reliance on the scientific community to, to, to be thinking about this and then to report and communicate to decision makers in a way um, where they can make wise decisions. That's really all we ask of them. Um, and, so, um, and so that's kind of the setup. Uh, Robert was very gracious to put soil moisture uh, on one of his slides. I immediately threw in some soil moisture slides in my talk because I, you know, it's like, wow, that, my heart was singing when I heard, uh, heard he was going to say this. And uh, so I, I, I do want to sort of talk about data, how, how we're taking data that's collected from different sources. These are both um, federal, state, and local sources how we're collecting data from satellites, from point sensors, you know, you go out into the stream and you measure the temperature, for example. How does that data get collated and brought into a single place where we can use it and make sense of it? And where the public, you all, and decision makers can essentially um, make some decisions from it. And without that, it's just really cool data for the scientists and the academics to write papers, which we love. Um, and so, um, and so um, Ben and I were talking about what is, what's something that we could do? Well, one, one project that I had been thinking about was what's, what's known as the Internet of Water. And it's basically a way of collecting and, and what we call harmonizing, but it's sort of integrating data from different sources, collected at different time periods in different ways, and bringing it together into one place where we can look at, look at these things and say, okay, what is, is anything changing? What are the things that are working, what's not working? What are the changes we could make to make things, to make things better? And so um, Vianne Rueda is my uh, former master's student. Um, she did a terrific job where she was essentially modeling the water movement through the city of Bernie. That was her master's project. She used a variety of techniques that I'll talk about. And then I added Ben because, you know, I had to. <laughs> and uh, and VNA is now a PhD student at the University of Michigan, and um, and so she she did a terrific job. So um, so let's kind of talk a little bit about going right into you know data, information, knowledge, and decisions. These are all different things. We could collect a lot of data, but without the context, these are just numbers. And and I and I guarantee that nobody will make a decision because of data. They make a decision from the knowledge from the data, from the stories that the data tell. And that's a really important thing, you know, the communications, when you talk to science communicators, you talk about data stories. What is the data trying to tell us? What are we, the questions we're asking? Are we asking the right questions? Are we analyzing the data in the right way? And so these, you know, these are, these are tricky um, issues quite a bit. And we're trying to basically have a straight line from where we collect the data to the decision makers. And I think that, that, to, uh, that to me, at least, that's, that's our responsibility for the people who are collecting the data to make sure that it's, it's presented and it's, um, it's combined in a way that the public can understand it. Because I can guarantee you, if the public doesn't know what the academics are doing, they will not support the academics. And we, if we don't do a better job of communicating what we're doing, you all will say, what the hell are they doing up in Austin? <laughs> and that's just bad. So we want to we wanna make it good. And so I had to put some data in here for soil moisture for, for Robert. And, and it was a paper published in Nature um, on, on how much water are the trees using. And when you look outside of this you know, beautiful terrain, um, what, two things you notice. First, the soils are very shallow. So there's very little soil water storage in the, in the soil itself. And during drought, and we had a, we just, we're still in a pretty severe drought, um, that soil is dry, but the plants have not died. So they're getting water from somewhere. And they're getting the water from what's known as rock water storage, rock storage. The question is, how much water are the plants using? How is that affecting groundwater recharge? What does this mean for the bigger picture of, of water resources for a region? And so the, the picture on the left is essentially the, the amount of water that can be stored in the soil. And the red here, we're kind of in this area. And the red is really low. Like, and this is in millimeters. So one millimeter is um, a really small amount of water. Even 25 millimeters is one inch. And so these are in areas where there's almost no water storage in the soil. And over here, here's how often, whoops, 
Here's how often the water um, is, is, is taken up by the, by the rocks. Um, and we're studying this right now, my, my group and I, for the Edwards Aquifer Authority, to get a sense of how much water is recharging through the soils to, into, the, into the karst material to the groundwater. Because all of the water planning processes require some estimate of how much water makes it back into the aquifer. And almost all of the estimates are based only on the karst features. And you know, as the water goes down, uh, down Cibolo and then it dives down into the aquifer, well, there's about 30% of the water actually is recharged through the soil. But we don't know where, we don't know when, and we're not really sure how much. So we're doing studies around the whole San Antonio area to get a better sense of that. And, and these, are, these are, you know, this is kind of the, the, data, the data thing I was talking about. Um, my group, so we run a network of soil monitoring stations across Texas. Uh, it's called um, the Texas Soil Observation Network, or Texan. You know, we had to come up with a snappy name. Nothing beats Texan for an observation network. Uh, and we're sending all of the data to NASA, and then NASA uses our site as a calibration site. And then what you're seeing here, this sort of red map, this is the amount of soil moisture across the whole state where the blue is more and the red is dry. But this is data coming straight from NASA. Um, their satellites fly over the state uh, three or four times, um, three or four times a, a month. And then the data, it goes through this process. Uh, and it usually, it, we are able to download it about five days late. And what we're trying to do now is work on, on bringing that latency from five days to near real time. And that's a whole, that's a whole difficult um, uh, problem that we're trying to solve. But you can see uh, most of our sites are up near Johnson City and uh, in Fredericksburg. Uh, the data is being used by the state of Texas. It's being sent to databases internationally. It's being used by Edwards Act for Authority, by Harris County Flood Control District and others. And so we're trying to push the data out as into as many places as possible so that people can, um, people can use it. And you know, th that point data is terrific. Um, the challenge is how do you combine that, right? These data are not as easy to combine with one another. And so this kind of is the segue into the Internet of Water um, that I was kind of talking about. And, and I, I guess I jumped the gun there. So you know, information and knowledge are vital. And here's one reason why. It's because we're trying to understand uh, what the recharge is and the recharge levels. And there's just a little graphic these plants are getting water from somewhere. They're getting water from this deep material, and that is preventing water from reaching the water table in some cases. Um, and so we are, so, so uh, after several discussions with Ben and I, I talked with the folks at the Mitchell Foundation. They were very interested in this. Um, the Internet of Water is a national program that's based out of Duke University in North Carolina. It has been uh, tested in multiple states, North Carolina, California, New the entire state of New Mexico is using the Internet of Water ideas. The challenge is that they've never actually used it for a municipality. It's only been used for really large scale state agencies. So Ben and I were thinking, look, let's try to do something for the city of Bernie. Let's use the Internet of Water concepts, taking data from the USGS, from the Water Development Board, from local, um, you know, from local water data collectors, the groundwater conservation districts and others, and let's bring it into one place that the city could use, the city utilities, the general public and others could use it. Um, and, uh, and so um, we were off and running. And, and we've been doing this mostly, we were a little bit hampered by COVID. We had a lot of outreach to community groups and so on, and, but we were able to power through all of it. And so this is kind of, the, this is sort of the life's lifespan. You get the data, you basically harmonize it, and then eventually you get to a point where you have, you know, happy people. And um, <laughs> like, I mean, that's just fabulous. And so what does this look like? Uh, you know, if we want to try to collect data, we have to first of all ask, the, ask people, what is important to you? And so we had uh, focus groups from the business community, from the environmental community, uh, the utilities, community service groups. I think we had five separate groups and we had spent hours with them asking how do they use data to make decisions right how does the city use it how does the business community use use the data how does the how would the public use it and it's it, it's it's really um, to me it was really great to hear everybody's different opinions and and in some cases there are community members in Bernie that don't even have internet well how would they be able to get data um, there's community members that don't speak English. How can we get them information so that they are able to use the data as well? So this is, there's a sort of equity part. 
And so when we talk with people, we ask them what data are available. How do we combine the data in a way that they can use it? And, um, and how do we present it to them so that it's useful? Uh, and then eventually we keep talking with people and we try to make it better. So this is sort of a virtuous cycle. Um, we, we, try to make it, we try to make it available and then we get feedback from people and then we try to make it better. And, um, and so we worked with these, you know, we had a, a process. This is uh, that, that graphic I showed before was sort of co-developed with Duke. Um, they are now pretty much at the national scale. We think that this process could be used by any medium-sized municipality in the state of Texas. And that's like the goal. Because if you have the data to make decisions, then you, you, you are in charge of your community, right? Like, I wouldn't say don't rely on the state. Rely on yourselves. Let's put it that way. Let's be happy about it. And so these are the groups that we met with. Um, you know, we, we convened a water committee, the public and private water utilities, um, and elected officials. We had focus group discussions with community uh, service organizations, environmental groups, and so on. And then we had a citywide survey that maybe some of you uh, took part in on, on, you know, on questions related to where do you get your information that's related to water? Do you get it from the internet? Do you get it from... The, um, do you get it from your neighbors? Do you get it from the, you know, from where do you get it? Social media? Do you get it from the, from Kendall County? Do you get it from the water utilities and so on? And so um, we had amazing response. We had almost 400 respondents for a survey that was sent out to the public, which really highlights how important water is, right? As, as Robert was, was surveying you all and why do you think water is important? And, um, and so this is, this is a little hard to read, but you know, just you can just kind of look at the, the colors. So the top bar is where do you get your water information? Well, most people, 17% get their water from the city website. Some of it getting from utility websites and groundwater conservation districts. That's these here. And then the bottom one is who do you trust? Well, what's interesting is 12% of people get their data from, or 11% from social media, but only 3% trust it. So my advice is don't use social media to get information. You want to find out what your kids are doing, use social media. But if you want to get information on water, use the utilities. And so, um, and so this was really um, encouraging that these institutions, conservation districts, city utilities, and city websites is where the majority of the information is trusted. Because if you can now, so then we knew who to talk with. Let's try and see how we can get their trusted information into a place where the community could use it. And then we made little cool little word clouds, you know, and water and development and growth. Uh, these are the things that are on everybody's mind, which is not surprising. We had a, a, a really nice um, outcome, which I'm sure is available on the internet to anybody who would like it. Recommendations continue to build public trust. We don't have a, as much of that these days. We need to continue to work on that. Diversify the water community, really get community service organizations and environmental groups to be more better represented on there. In, ensure integration of water data with other initiatives, right? Development, like put development right out there. Um, that, the water, that the data content responds to what people need. This is really challenging because when we ask people, tell us how you would use the data, and then they tell us, and then we pattern everything after that, then they use it in ways that are totally different. So there's almost no correspondence between what they say they're going to do and what they actually do because, you know, people are people, and they're incomprehensible sometimes. Um, and then we want to integrate the water data with other public data sources. Okay, so that's all good. So now here's some um, graphs that are going to blow your mind. Um, we, we did entire modeling of how all of the water enters the Bernie community, where the water goes, um, and so I, 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 know, I know these are difficult to read, so I put supply, demand, and endpoints in really big letters. And so all, these are all the sources of water that come into the city. Canyon Reservoir, Bernie Lake, uh, storage in Bernie Lake, the Trinity Aquifer, all of these places, rainfall, run, uh, how much water is running into the community from upstream, how, where does the water go? These are all the areas where water is, is in demand. And we actually tie it into the economic development report to get a sense of how much, you know, what is the economic activity in the city, how much water are companies using? because that becomes a really important um, part of all of this. How much water is being used by the municipality for landscape irrigation? How much outdoor landscape irrigation is the, is the public using? What time of the year are they using it? Um, Bernie has a, a fantastic wastewater reuse program, so that's like a source of water. And then the use of the endpoints. 
Cibolo Creek, some of it's recharged, um, deep recharged to the aquifer, some of it's transported out. There's a lot of evapotranspiration. This is the water that the plants use. This is the water that just evaporates out of the lake and things like that. And then there's water that's transformed. You transform, you, you cook your pasta, and the water is now absorbed into the pasta, and then you eat it. So now there's a transformation. So that's where all the, this is all the places where the water goes. This is where all the water places where the water comes in. We then go from this, what's known as a causal loop diagram, and then we make it even kind of more complicated by putting this thing into a miracle code where we actually put numbers on every one of these. How, what is the gallons per day per person that's being used during the winter time versus the summertime? How much water is being pumped back in terms of purple pipe that's being used in, um, uh, in the city, which, by the way, is an absolutely fantastic program. And there was an article in Today's Statesman that San Marcos is going to be doing the same thing. Uh, purple pipe, big purple pipe article. And so we, we ran this whole model so that we could get a sense of if, if we were to change one thing that would add more conservation and add more sort of water to the city, what would it be? And it, it turns out to be landscape irrigation was the, was the big one and to, to go zero scaping whenever possible. But the other part of that, of course, is continue to uh, ramp up the reuse of water uh, into purple pipe because that takes, that has a, a very, very meaningful decrease on the pressure for the potable water systems. And, um, and the city utilities folks were fabulous with us. So there's where the supply comes in, there's where the demand is, indoor and outdoor, and there's unused allocation. And then finally, this is where the endpoints are. And so we modeled all of this so that we could get a sense of it. And then the goal is to try to get, is to use this for some water planning in the future. The model's now available, the city's able to, to use it, and, and so on. Um, and so, you know, um, so, so VNA finished her master's thesis, thankfully, you know, never let a student go to waste. Um, and, um, and then she got hired by the city, uh, which, was a, which was also a coup, to actually implement the Internet of Water for the city of Bernie. And she was a very good coder, she's very, very smart, and she already knew how the water moved in and out of the community, so it was very, very helpful. Um, and these are the things that we did um, you know, going forward. We designed and implemented the Water Data Hub. This is all the data coming in from federal, state, and local sources into one location. We engaged with the Bernie Water community to get a sense of what they would like to see. In, in, in the display of data. We finished the modeling. We, we looked at a technical advisory committee with both the Water Development Board, local, um, you know, local uh, GCD managers and utility managers, and then we released a dashboard, and uh, that is now publicly available on your utility webpage. And so um, there's a little bit of numerical computer wizardry that we have to deal with. It's everything from we create a repository for all the data, we install all the graphing applications, we have to pull the data from, uh, from the USGS, from the National Weather Service, from the groundwater conservation districts, and then we pull all of that into an, what we call an ingestion. So we, we eat the data, and then we update all of the files, and then we basically display it. Um, this took about four months of a full-time person who had never done it before, but now, and then we developed a manual that, so that any community could basically take this and run with it and uh, probably require maybe a, a quarter of an FTE, a full-time equivalent, maybe three months of a person's time to deploy this anywhere. So it's, it's very efficient. And so um, I'm just gonna show you some uh, snapshots. This was, uh, uh, I think I did a screenshot yesterday. So this is as of October 24th. This, this just kind of gives you a sense of what it looks like. This is, we call this the splash page. We got the, you know, we got the city of Bernie colors. We got all the maps, which I'm gonna show you and some nice pictures. And then we have a whole series of, okay, here's how you use this, right? So we would really like to have people use it and then tell us how we can make it better. I think that uh, Mayor Handron would like to see this made even more simple. It's very tricky to understand how people, how people view data and then they internalize it. It's almost, uh, it's for, for a soil physicist, it's almost a bridge too far for me to do that. I, mean, I need a psychologist to, to help with that. Um, and so we have, um, all of these are little, you click on these, here's the, the, the water demand. I'm gonna show you this. We have population data. Everything is built on this map, um, and so it automatically 
you know, automatically post this. You can, you can turn map layers, a county, a groundwater management area. You can turn on wells and precipitation stations. You can look at drought status. All of that is you just click on it and the thing just lights up for you. Um, this is a, a shows the, um, the percent in the, in, the, in the area in drought. And so this is similar to what Robert showed before. This is where we are right now. This is as of this week. And so, yeah, we're, this area of the state is in quite a lot of drought. Um, and then these are all the water wells that are in the area. You can click on any water well, and it will show you, well, what is the water level in that well? And if the, if it's, if the, if the little dots are red, bad. If the dots are blue, good. You know, we should have made green good and red not so good. Um, and then here's the water level, and you can compare it to any year that the data is available. So this is the water level in a well just to the south of the city. Um, so you can see there's the, there it is. It's the Twin Canyon well. And we have started dropping off because of the drought. You can see the water levels getting deeper and deeper. And that means um, a lot of things. If eventually, water level keeps dropping. It's going to cost more money to pump the water, right? Because it takes electricity to push that water up higher. Uh, if the wells run dry, that's bad. Um, Concan, I think, is uh, they've lost almost every one of the wells in their well field. I think there's, they were down to one well as of a month ago out of a nine. So this is like a critical problem for them. Uh, and other areas of the state, they're going to be looking at this. And I have a, I have a postdoc that's actually doing studies on, water, on groundwater, groundwater levels. Um, we, we have excellent data from your utilities. You should all praise your utility managers and the work that they are doing because it's fabulous. Um, and so this is the daily demand of water, and this is a comparison that goes back all the way to 2002. You could look at every month or week of demand for the city of Bernie uh, and the region, and you can see how much higher the demand is this year. So this is the highest demand ever recorded in the city of Bernie. You can see the cumulative demand, and that's because we're in a drought and because there's more people, and there's more people irrigating their lawns. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just uh, fairly straightforward. Um, and this, by the way, this big spike, you know what that big spike is? That was winter storm Uri, when all the pipes froze and the entire system leaked out, right? We lost 100 million gallons in Austin. I'm not sure how much was lost here, but that was the high. We're trying to figure out what do we do with this? We <laughs> probably should put a little arrow and say, her is winter storm Uri, Uri. Um, but that was, a, that was a mess, to say the least. Uh, for everybody. So um, anyway, so this puts the data into context, right? You can, you can go back on a map like this and you could put where your population centers are. You could put your, any socioeconomic information, any groundwater data, any vegetation data can be basically added to this map. We try to balance what's appropriate and what's easy you know, if we put everything on there, then you're gonna, you, people are going to look at this and go, oh my God, you know. It's sort of like being faced with 50 choices. Who can make 50 choices? Give people three choices. And then they can make decisions, right? And so we didn't want to make it so complicated that people would, would cry. But we wanted to make it simple enough so that they can get information from it and say, oh, okay, now I understand. And that's what we really wanted. Um, this is your main utility page. Where can you find it? It's right there. Uh, I understand there's going to be a splashy rollout with like twi with tweets mm -hmm. and little videos and you know probably some articles, right, Ben? Ben's promise this is going to happen soon, <laughs> not next year, but soon, yes. right? So um, because we would like to see people use it, we're re I'm really interested, you know, like professionally, but also I'm very curious. How will people use this? And so I will be coming back, and I'll find you, <laughs> and um, and then you will, then you'll tell me I, I never even went there. That's Bad. Okay, so you know what does the future hold? Okay, the Internet of Water is one example of how data and information are harmonized, and I put harmonized underlined because that that is really the trick. We have satellites that fly around that gives us data maybe three or four times a month. We have water level data that's collected in a, at a point. Um, we have um, you know we have data in a, in a well. We have water level that's being collected in rivers. All the data is collected in different ways. It's stored by different agencies, and the agencies don't talk to one another. I mean, I'm not sure if, if anybody believes that TCEQ and the Water Development Board speak to one another. I suppose they do. A little bit. Yeah. A little bit, but not enough to actually combine their data. So we are figuring out, trying to figure out ways to combine the data. That's harmonizing. T technology is allowing data collected from agencies and community members to be combined. Five years ago, we couldn't have done this. 
And, and now the feds, the state, and others are coming up with ways to standardize the data collection and the storage so that we can go in and pull the data. It's like going into a buffet at the, at the, at the, you know, at the, at the restaurant. You go and you pull the data you need, and then they manage the data. We just get the data we need, and then we post it. And that's how we're doing this here. We're not trying to recreate a massive database that will take you know, terabytes of storage. We're just going in, pulling the data that other people are making available, and then we use it. And that's, um, that's a really nice way of doing it. We want to try, and we would love to have other communities in the state of Texas try this uh, and use it so that they have control over their future and they have a better understanding of their water resources. I mean, this is sort of democratizing data so that people can use it. If people don't, are not using the data, then why are we collecting it? And, and how much faith can you put into the decisions that people are making? So, so anyway, without... I mean, I, I knew I brought my soapbox around here somewhere. <laughs> I, I think I hid it behind the podium. And so the Mitchell Foundation, um, Cynthia and George Mitchell Foundation was super generous. They're really terrific to work with and um, I'm very grateful. Cibolo Center has been a great partner and, um, and all of these organizations here. We, could, we wouldn't really be able to do this without people being interested and without community groups and that's what I kind of started off my, my spiel with, is that you, know, you all are here on probably the nicest day in six months because of your interest in your community. And, and so those partners have, are, uh, is what made um, this successful. Other communities may maybe not as much, but for us, this has been great. Okay, I'm gonna stop there, and um, I guess we have, we're gonna yeah. be, the Inquisition will begin. Great, thank you. So we're going to do a quick Q&A, um, and uh, I'm just going to sit up here with them. So Michael, if you want to join us here. Um, but uh, yeah, so this Internet of Water project has been really cool, and it's been really fun to work with Michael and me and on it. Um, it's, it seems, to be honest with you guys, um, I'm kind of new to their world. Like, I get to be on the Texas Water Data Initiative group with you guys, and it's all these like, data experts and I'm the, the advocate, right? And uh, of course, I'm always constantly saying, we gotta make this data relevant to local communities. We gotta make it relevant to local communities. I'm like a broken record at this point. But at the same time, I, say, I, I do find myself kind of almost uh, blown away that a lot of this consilience of data, this sort of bringing it all together and making it so that it's easier to see and understand, doesn't seem like it's been done until now. And that blows my mind, to be honest with you. Um, so, it's cool to be a part of it. I'm grateful to be a part of it. I'm grateful that you're, you've helped lead the way and uh, bravo. It's cool. So, um, quick, easy question for you. Just watching the Internet of Water uh, uh, presentation, is there, you talked about your work with Dr. Gammon, um, the state climatologist, and now you're working to downscale data so that it's more relevant, I guess, at local levels. Is that information that could be relevant for, say, the Internet of Water dashboard? Yes. Um, yes, thank you for ask, asking that question. Uh, the uh, I got talking too much about my cats, I guess, and ran short on time. But um, the goal for the project we're we're doing to quantify impacts of climate change on water resources in Texas um, will be served in an open data format. So, so y'all or, or Dr. Young or anybody can um, pull that information down. And and use it as they see appropriate. So, um, as you mentioned, I've been on that water data initiative um, for a while now, and, and certainly bought in. You know, I'm all for the making data available for people to use, and, uh, and, and developing tools that make it easy for people to access that data and, and be able to determine the story of what it's what it's telling. Them. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm going to sit with you, Robert, just for a minute. Uh, because we are talking about the, the, this, the climate change data. Um, you know, I talked about intellectual honesty, right, for, as, as, I, as I was opening uh, this, this presentation. And I was talking about the ability to basically park your, your beliefs and your political leanings and uh, really look at information and stare at the face. Um, and i got to be honest with you, I've always been a little bit, um, I don't want to say this, confused as to how this has gotten so politicized. This, this matter of climate change. And the reason is this. When I looked at the arc of history, uh, there was uh, a period that was known as the Little Ice Age. 
I was sent around uh, know, the 1600s to I guess the 1900s. And uh, you know, I remember I you know, go to museums in uh, Europe or whatever and I see these amazing uh, pictures of these old warships and they'd be in ice, like just surrounded by ice. And I, I heard about like uh, on the River Thames in London they would have these festivals on the ice. And I've been to London since and I've never seen any indication it's ever going to freeze over, right? So in other words, that was sort of a climate change, right? The, the question, I guess, becomes, you know, A, why is it so politicized if you have anything you'd like to share on that, <laughs> if, that if that's comfortable for you? But um, the other one is what di would differentiate what we're seeing now from, say, that, the natural climate variation of, or that kind of climate variation that we saw during the global ice age? So on the politicized part, I, you know, I worked at the state for 18 years as a as a scientist, and and uh, you know, and politics can be frustrating for many reasons. You know, it can be frustrating um, for scientists. What what I learned was what I felt was like my place, which was you know, there's, there's many things that influence political decisions, and it might be Uncle Bob who cooks hot dogs on on a three-day weekend that has the senator's ear on a particular issue. Um, where I saw my role was, was as a scientist and in, in presenting you know, cold, sober, hopefully understandable analysis of what the science says, such that the science at least was at the table being considered. And then the, the, the politicians go off and do their thing. Um, with, with my classes, I teach a class on Groundwater management and uh, and science, and they talk about um, policy because you know a lot of a lot of folks want to tell other folks what to do, or right? you know how the world should be, and um, you yeah, know that policy is a function of people, and and it's raised to a power, um, and that that uh, raised to the power is a function of money, and so when there's money involved. And people, um, it just complicates them. You know, there's a number of examples over the years you can point to um, cigarettes, cigarette smoking for a long time. Um, you know, because banning cigarettes or controlling smoking was would be have economic consequences in certain parts of the country and certain companies, and so uh, they responded to protect their business, and, and they had deep pockets to do that, and so. Um, so, so in those situations, it's like even though the, the medical science was clear there's a connection between smoking and lung cancer, um, for many decades it was um, smoking that, that, that won out. Now I always say science wins in the end. Um, it always wins in the end, unless you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it always wins in the end, and uh, just because eventually um, you know, the truth comes out. I want to be careful though, it's like science is seeking of the truth. Um, and you know, like those error bars I showed you, there's you know, there's assumptions that are made, there's there's uncertainty in the science that, that hopefully with time becomes more certain. Um, and so so it's a constant work to improve um, our understanding of, of natural systems. And what was the second question? It was about the what the hell's going on with the little ice age. Well, that no, I mean, it was that there have been natural climate variations, and um, that are, I mean, they really stand out in history. That ice age, was, I mean, it froze the Baltic Sea, as I understand it. That's a, that's a massive amount of cold, if you will. <laughs> so then, so then, why is it that we would say, okay, well, this is a different than that, or what's? Um, well, I guess it's it's. Uh, you know, yes, the climate has changed over the past, and those are good examples. And, and that plot I showed you shows some, you know, things used to be a lot warmer. I think, I think the key question is, is what's causing it? Um, and so, is it is it something natural, um, or is it is it not? Uh, I'm forgetting the details of the ice age. I think it was volcanism in Iceland that played a role in that. Um, there was. Uh, um, I don't think this is responsible for the ice age, but or the, the uh, little ice age. But uh, um, when Europeans first discovered North America and introduced European diseases, it wiped out an estimated 90 percent of, of Native American population. 90 million people gone, 
And native tribes were managing the landscape at a continental scale in North and in South America, and that went away, which, which caused a bunch of regrowth, um, which caused a decrease in CO2, which also caused a cool um, which is part of that kind of landscape situation. So, so to me as a scientist, it's like it's not so much, I mean, of course, climate has changed in the past. The question is, is why has it changed? And I, think, I think the group is to kind of add something. I mean, you try to put your shoes into the, put the standard of the shoes of the public. You know, we have these projections, whether it's RCP 8.5 or whatever, with big error bars. And, you know, you know there people are saying, look, we need to spend trillions of dollars to essentially address this right away with error bars and the future, which is, which is uncertain. And it's a hard lift to do that. Um, and if we do it too quickly, then we, we basically we see what's happening in and Germany right now to try to do this too quickly. They made like horrendous choices in Germany right now, and they're about to pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, and they're paying for it in the UK, which is now the like, highest electricity prices in all of Europe. So we have to be able to do this in a way that's um, that's consistent. It's slow enough so that the change isn't drastic. It's comprehensive enough so that we aren't affected by shocks to the system. Most people probably didn't expect Russia to do such a turnoff. Gas, but some people may have. I don't know. But that was not a very resilient system. Right? So we have to come up with a way, and we, then we have to let the public know that this is going to be a decadal change. You know, we started as society burning wood, and Germany is still burning wood today. And there's like a billion people that cook their food burning wood. And so this is a really hard problem. In the 1600s, I don't know what the population, what the population was, but it just hit 8 billion. So having those kinds of problems when you have this many people, that becomes a, a, a confounding issue. Much more difficult now. Uh, do you want to ask questions? Yeah. Um, sorry, it, it's easy to talk about what's going to happen in the future, but when you're just talking about everyday people, how do we get them not to put in massive lawns and when they think that their water just magically comes out of a tap, how do we not get a little bit, you know, water Nazi-ish when we're talking about people are? <laughs> how do you talk to just normal people and get them to change their habits? I like a paradigm shift question. Well, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, people don't like being told to Right, so if you tell them not to do it, okay, then they're going to do it. Right? It's sort of like, you know, I tell my dog not to bark, she goes outside the house. And it's all this thing. So you can't, you can't, you can't, because there's a cat outside. So you can't tell people, you, you incentivize them, or you essentially provide them with information, right? Or you just use tiered water rates. Yeah. You say, okay, well, if you want to water your lawn, you're gonna have, you're gonna pay 10x, you know, if you want it, you know, and we'll just here's how many people live in a house, and if you're 35 pounds per day per person, then you're good, and if you're 350 pounds per day per person, you just pay four times more, and then if, and then that that will incentivize people without telling them. Who's gonna make those decisions? This is where your wise leaders come in with data. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's it, that is a you know, that's a third rail in Texas groundwater is is uh, it's meter and you know it's it's a private property right state um, and um, you know that is you it's it's really a challenge it's a real challenge I have to, I have to say I, mean, I I was testifying in front of uh, Senator Perry's subcommittee last session and man if I get in here for a lot of I'm still had to put it there. But, you know how much it was like my extra cost in days is much more cost now just to get past that PTAs and you. Yeah, it's really hard to change people's behavior, but um, and maybe I'm naive, but I still have hope for you know education, um, you know, storytelling, the data. I mean, I, I didn't know the cost difference between my house and in my co-workers' household, that's a lot of margaritas. I mean, that was, that was what, a couple, it was at least $1,000, so there's some real money saving there. 
And, and I also kind of get the um, enamorment with, with graphs. And so A&M has been doing some cool things with the, like the Aggie Zoysia that we have that looks like the turf, looks like St. Augustine, um, but, it, but once it's established, it doesn't require watering. Um, now I'm on the Austin Water Forward planning panel, and you know, they've talked about putting in drought tolerant zoysia, but, but, and it's supposed to go dormant and it turns brown, and, and they can't get people to stop watering it because they want they want it to stay green the whole time. And so, you know, so there's still still challenges even in encouraging people to, to do those things. But I think you know when I tell people about uh, our um, you know, the money we save, you know, I don't have to be outside. It seems like more and more people hire people to come over your yards, but um, so they don't have to go outside. It's just the bill they pay. Um, um, ed education. But, you know, remember when Cape Town was fixing to run out of water day zero? They were like 30 days from completely running out of water. And I've been doing some research on that situation. Only half of their population responded to reducing water use, mm -hmm. which shocked me. <laughs> and there was, uh, you know, there's multiple reasons for that. And part of it is, is, is uh, I think maybe it was over messaging, and so it just became noise. There's people just don't watch the news. And then, and then there was um, opposition to the party that had the mayorship that that was laying claim to that it wasn't happening. It was all made up of political control. So, yeah, no I got another question, but we'll set one. Can you talk a little bit about the role of citizen scientists in generating the data that we're going into the systems? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, a really good example of that is Ross, which is the community data collection for uh, precipitation. Um, and, uh, and so, that's a, that's a really good example of where we're going to be able to come in. I think the challenge is that there are a lot of citizens collecting data. But, they're, but the data is not being kept in the same place. So if there was a citizen data hub, citizen data data hub, uh, then that would that would really make a difference, and that that would be a terrific program for the for the city to have. That if that if, um, if there's a citizen science collecting data, and there's a lot of ways to be able to do that, even using impressions, you know, you just take a picture of your phone, and that itself becomes a data set. Um, but the, but uh, how, how would we collect it? And that, that, that itself would be a really interesting um, study to do. So, uh, at, the, at the Meta Center, we have Texas Stream Team. And so, and so we do have a central database. Um, I'll have to go check to see if it's open data, but, um, but hopefully it is. That, um, there was a, a student up at University of North Texas that did a study on how good the data was, and it was really good. It's like 90, 95 percent of it was was solid, um, which meant it could be actionable. You know that that scientists could use it. Another opportunity is like you know all, all these folks that have their own weather stations, um, fill in the gaps. Some some scientists, not us of course, but some scientists are pretty snooty about <laughs> data. Um, I don't know about you, but I mean I, I, I work all the time with crappy data. Yeah. Or, you know, quote unquote, non, non, yeah, not peer reviewed or not, not collected by scientists. Um, but, um, you yeah, know, for example, when I was at the agency, we started Text Mesonet, which was a kind of a network of weather station data. And I wanted to bring in, um, it wasn't Coco Ross, but uh, um, kind of citizen um, weather station data. And, uh, and the scientists that we hired were like, we can't, we can't use that data. You know, it doesn't meet the standards of the ten thousand dollar National Weather Service certified weather station. I was like, I've got one of these systems in my backyard. It's pretty damn accurate. You know, I'm pretty close to an area. And we had a system come through, and one of the stations showed fifteen inches of rain, and uh, and staff took it down because they thought it was inaccurate. Well, I went over to weather.com, brought up the citizen network. And saw that there, there indeed was a large system that went through and dumped a bunch of rainfall. So there's, there's value um, in that data. We tried to build that in, but at that point, Weather Station had bought um, the uh, Weather Underground, and they wanted like thirty thousand dollars a year for that data. So, so there's money in citizen science too, apparently. And these stations are available. You can actually plug the, the, 
these stations are um, only three hundred fifty dollars, and they're completely self-contained, and it sends the data directly to the weather underground, oh, and, right. and which is really neat. And, um, and I was actually just looking yesterday. I, I want one, you know, and uh, and whether it uh, connects to Coco Ross, which you really uses the National Weather Service. So um, there's a lot of things that the public can do to, to help water. So I got, I guess it would be a bit of an uncomfortable question, it actually goes to both of you really, because um, you know one of the questions that my friend who's on the, uh, the board of the preserve was asking is, you know, uh, is what we're seeing in California a bit of an indicator for what we might see in the future in Texas? You know, we've got severe drought, they've got wildfires. I was reading recently about the soil dehydration and how that's thrown off a lot of different models and understanding as well as the water hydraulic cycle. How is that uh, giving uh, natural factors? What that mean? Is that what we can expect to see here in Texas going forward? <laughs> <laughs> Very likely. <laughs> um, uh, yes. The, the, uh, I was at a panel um, a couple of weeks ago, Texas Water Conservation Association and, and uh, someone from the Weather Service was, was on there from Dallas. And like one of the project projections from, from climate change is that we're going to see, you know, drier and longer dry spells, and then when it does rain, it's going to be far more intense. And, and this, you know, this summer up in Dallas, he was noting that they had the longest stretch of dry days on record, and then they had a record amount of rainfall. Um, so, you know, we're seeing more and more of that. State climatologist sees that uh, across the state, further intensification of rain. And, uh, and I didn't mention it, but, but uh, you know, soils were a key part of this. The soil is where the, the grease hits the griddle or the rain hits the surface of the land. And, and if those soils are super dry, they just shrunk, suck it all up. Um, and then it gets a bapo transpired and plant sweat it back up in the atmosphere. Um, it doesn't run off and it doesn't go deeper and, and recharge the aquifers. And, and we're seeing um, record low inflows in the Highland Lakes um, that uh, you know, we've not seen before, but we've actually been in drier conditions before. So it seems like um, it's just the temperature, and there's a direct correlation between temperature and soil moisture and impacts on water resources. You, that's it? Mike? No, I mean, I, you know, I, can, I can go on. I mean, I don't know how much time I can do this all, all day, you know. And, and, but, uh, well, yeah, it's good thought, though. Well, I mean, in terms of soil moisture, I mean, I love soil water. You know, I mean, who doesn't, right? I mean, I've tried for 35 years to make soil water sexy, and, it, and I think that finally, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's not even there. I mean, with Robert's talking about it. Um, no, I mean, look, you know, when, you know, if, if there's an amplification of heat, it, it dries soil. And this is the problem, is that when we had to drive in 2011, the soils were, the, the, the soils, it was hotter and drier than Tucson. And I spent 10 years in Tucson. And it took five years for the soil to essentially reestablish a normal pattern where as soon as it rains, it gets transpired right back up. So there's no recharging of the Highland Lake system, for example. We're seeing that happen again. And because the soils are drier, there's more conduction, there's more sensible heat flux. So it just becomes a reinforcing cycle that more of the sun's energy goes straight back up so the air is hotter, which causes the leaves to essentially transpire more. And it just it becomes almost a uh, it becomes a, a non virtual cycle when it comes to water contained in the soil, and um, and if the if the weather projections are correct and the sort of 100, the current dry line is going to move 80 75 100 miles to the east, that means most of the recharge areas for all of the springs, the Highland Lake system, all this whole area of the hill country is going to have the same precip as what's currently west of the Baltimore. Which is dry. And so that has a big implication in an area that's growing quickly. How do we, this is where the California thing comes in, how do we manage that with more people and less water? And that's the reality of what of where we're most likely headed. Just an interesting little tidbit. Um, of all the rain that falls in Texas, 86% of it goes right back up into the sky. So evaporation from lakes and river surfaces, and, and, but the vast majority of it is evapotranspiration. Plants pulling it out of the soil and the rock and then evaporating, sweating it back up into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so just, just a small percentage increase in uh, the evapotranspiration may have a big impact on recharge and runoff to rivers. Yeah, I knew you had something to say. I'm going to do one last question, and then, um, I guess, did, Alex, do you, do you have a question? Yes, okay. I'm going to try to keep it real quick. Um, one concern that I have, and this has been a great presentation, is Kendall County um, is in a unique challenge, unprecedented, growing very rapidly with an exquisitely sensitive watershed with our karst and our sinkholes and our caves. And one concern, and I'd like to see how are we going to address this, is the issue of pollution both from new roads, new developments, new parking lots, and all the surface contaminants, as well as increased wastewater that is only treated right now with sludge techniques, being discharged with increasing amounts into all of our streams and waterways. All of these are going to be increasing levels of contaminants going eventually to our drinking water, and it's been very difficult for me to find out how is this being monitored, how is it going to be controlled, and improved, for example, um, upgrading all the wastewater treatment facilities to include re reverse osmosis and infiltration. Um, I see that as a growing problem, and we are unique in our challenges, unlike many other uh, metropolitan areas. All right, that was a question. Who wants it? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a, that's a great, great question. And it's, it's one that many of us in the Hill Country are, are struggling with. Um, it, it, it's something that we're actively working on at the Meadow Center and the Hill Country Alliance is, is working on that. And there's, and there's a lot of politics involved. You know, one, one way is there's, you know, increasing the, as you mentioned, increasing the treatment requirements before you surface discharge. Um, treated wastewater and you know EPA encourages that. Florida has taken advantage of that ability in their karst terrains, um, but there's been uh, a lot of reluctance to do that in Texas so far um, because they don't want to have you know special rules for part of the state versus versus other parts of the state. It's doable because somehow Austin got it through the catchments of the Highland Lakes and the catchments of Barton Springs. You can't service discharge there. Um, but you also got to be careful because you know, they require pretty much land application, um, but that also seeps into the groundwater system, which then discharges to the surface water system, which then makes it in the Barton Springs, in the Edwards Aquifer in the Barton Springs. So we're seeing some of that happening. Um, one thing that's happening. Uh, although some folks might find it unsavory, is because property has gotten so expensive in the hill country and particularly you know, close to Austin that um, there's some communities that are doing direct potable reuse. So they're treating their wastewater all the way to drinking water standards, reverse osmosis, like you mentioned, and then putting it back into the distribution system. Um, I, I never thought I would see direct potable reuse in Texas during my career, and it happened out in Big Spring. I'm out in West Texas, and, and El Paso is building a huge plant right now. And then, you know, this this uh, West Western Travis County Public Utility Agency is doing it. Buda has it in the state water plan. Other communities are looking at doing it. So um, that could be hard selling because that's that's toilet to tap. You know, I'm all for it, um, but um, you know, people can be in it. Quite frankly, that water is cleaner than anything. You would get because if it goes through reverse osmosis, it's stripping everything out of it. So, so it's people are working on it, but it's hard. Um, you know, the river authorities want that water put back in the river because they want to um, sell, yeah, sell it. Um, and uh, so that's you know, so so somehow dealing with those issues. They've also told me that they'd be okay with, you know, people did do advanced treatments and including up to reverse osmosis. Um, but at that point, if you're putting it back in the river, in my, my opinion, you're wasting it. You should keep it and you know, reuse it um, if at all possible. The, uh, but, you know, we're working on, like, like some of these one water techniques um, do help minimize the, and one of the goals is to minimize um, wastewater discharge to surface water streams. And so. We're working right now with the city of Blanco to um, do something that, that avoids having to do wastewater discharge. And then just hoping that these demonstration projects 
Um, not even demonstration projects, real projects that people can go kick the tires on and inspire more to do things in the non-traditional way that's um, good for the hill country. All right, well, I think we're going to wrap up Q&A. Um, if you'd like to, please stick around. We're going to uh, have some, um, I guess, uh, a little bit of a mixer after this. If you want to come, you know, I'll be around. I know Michael, I think he has to run. He's got an uh, anniversary that he needs to go attend to. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Thank you, uh, Robert. Really appreciate you coming down. And uh, I appreciate all of you guys attending. And yes, please stick around. We'll be happy to answer questions as well. Thank you.